So, hello everybody and welcome to this presentation on ultra low latency with Java and terabytes of data. And let's linger on that title for a while. I mean, ultra low latency, Java and terabytes. Uh, how is that really possible? Well, we will see. So Amper, uh, I've been around since Java 1.0, uh, have a, through a few startups, I have a big uh, blog, and I have done 40 plus talks around the world. Java 1 Dev Nexus is just one of them. I'm the co-author of uh, Modern Java, and I've written some articles for Oracle J uh, Magazine. So I'm going to talk about this. Uh, how many of you guys has ever put in a progress indicator in your code? <laughs> well. Quite few of you up there. Uh, this is bad, of course. You, you don't want to have that. So I'm going to talk about the opposite, how to not have progress indicators, how, to, how you can get speedy and snappy code. I'm going to talk about ultra-low latency. And I have the benefit of defining this, because this is my presentation. So I define ultra-low latency as uh, 200 nanoseconds. And what is really 200 nanoseconds? Well, it, it, it turns out that. It takes one nanosecond for the speed of light to go from my, uh, this side of my laptop to that side of the laptop. So 200 nanoseconds isn't that much. It's about the time it takes to go up there and back again for, this, for, the, for light. So it's a very short period of time. Uh, for reference, it will take you about 100 nanoseconds just to read 64 bits from main memory. So we're talking about really low latency here. And how is that even important to you? I mean, you, maybe you're doing uh, web services and you're concerned about a second or half a second. Well, then the problem is like this. Maybe you have a bunch of microservices that runs and they all run in a, ch in a chain. So every microservice response is, is important. Or maybe you have a compound computation that contains millions of steps. And then each step becomes very important because your total outcome uh, is of course dependent on each step. So that's why it's usually very important with low latency. So why are applications slow? There are many reasons to that. This is just uh, a few of them. Uh, you know, the number one, slow databases. Maybe you have data on several nodes and you have no affinity across your data. I'm going to talk more about affinity and what that is uh, further on in the presentation. Maybe data is remote in some sense. Maybe you create a lot of unnecessary objects and you have problems with garbage collection. Or maybe there is a lack of parallelism. Maybe you have like a bunch of, of CPU cores, but you can't really use them. They're just sitting there, unused. So let's start talk about uh, slow databases. And I think I will not spend so much time around this. We all know that databases, they get clogged the more that you have there. And even the fact that the database is remote kind of excludes it from ultra low latency because it's on a network usually. So let's talk more about affinity and what is affinity really. Affinity is kind of a, uh, the stickiness with which different objects can be combined, how they are not related because relational is kind of occupied in this space. But I will give you an example after this uh, overall uh, view. So if you have low affinity, that is, data is not that related to each other, and you want low latency and you want to scale out, it turns out you can't do that. You can, however, have low affinity and scale out, but then it's not low latency. Or you can have, if you have low affinity, you can have low, um, low latency, but then you can't scale out. So why is that? Well, let's look at this example. I have squares and triangles here in this picture. And we can say that this, uh, I don't know what kind of color it is. Let's call it blue. Uh, I'm not colorblind, but uh, I don't know the name of that color. So let's call it blue, and we have red. And we have squares and triangles. So let's say uh, that the blue stuff, the blue stuff, that's male uh, fashion. And red is uh, fashion for women. And let's say uh, the squares are shirts, and the triangles are uh, trousers. So here we have a clear affinity. All men, they are wearing certain shirts and they have certain trousers, so they, they, are affini if they can be related to each other. And also, the same is for, for uh, women. 
they have the red ones. So we can put all the male stuff on one node and all the women's stuff on the other node, and we can do computations, and everything is fine. But then next year's fashion strikes us and makes a mess of our application, because this year there's a unisex fashion. It was like that I was a kid in Sweden, and boys and girls, they wore the same clothes. So the trousers are the same. So now what do we do? We don't know if it's a girl trousers or a man trousers. So of course we can put all the trousers on every node. And then we still have speed. But then we don't have scale out. This is scale up. Because if you have uh, this uh, triangle can represent maybe one type of trousers, but it can also represent a million times of trousers. So, but then we can have another strategy. We can place some of the trousers on one node and some of the trousers on another node. But if we need to uh, combine them, we need to convey them over the network, and then it's not ultra related anymore. So that is one example. And in this example, I only had two different object types, and I only have two nodes. So what if I have eight nodes in eight different object types? Or what if I have hundreds of object types and hundreds of nodes. How does that really look like? And you might think that's tricky to understand what's the outcome, but I have a, a picture that's showing exactly how that looks like. It looks like this. You can't really do it. So we can't have low affinity, low latency, and scale out at the same time. OK, so let's go to the next point. Um, data is somewhat remote. And here I have a picture of, uh, of uh, the United States. So if I have one server in, say, San Francisco and another one in New York, uh, that's not obviously not low latency because it takes the speed of light is four to five milliseconds if you're running fibers, which is slower than uh, microlinks, for example. So we can't use that. So let's go to the other extremes. Uh, if you see the, the, the up here, the, the part on top. Then we have two Linux servers connected via a, a router or a switch. And that, if you make that really fast, you can do it in 100 microseconds. But that orders of magnitude is too slow. So let's look at the other example. You just have two Linux nodes, and you just have a, a run a wire between them, and you do everything you can to really push down the low latencies. You, you do like thread, you have thread affinity, you take away interrupt, and you're busy polling and it'll all that kind of black belt technology, then you might come down to 25 microseconds, which is still two orders of magnitude too slow for my definition of ultra-low latency. So the conclusion is here that you can't have ultra-low latency if you're running on another node. So let's say, what if we have it on the same node? Maybe we have it running in another process. Well. That's not going to work either, because you, when you do a context switch in Linux, uh, you will pay like one to three microseconds, and you will usually ruin your caches when you do the context switch, because you, are, you have to restore uh, registers, you have to you know, use another stack pointer, and that's not in the cache in the CPU, so it takes a long time. So that's that. Uh, here is probably the... the slide in this conference that contains the least characters. It's only two characters, apart from the title. It says one second. And what is one second? Yeah, that's, that might be the time for a garbage collect. Might be less, might be longer. But when you do garbage collect, you don't have ultra low latency. Because if you have stopped the world garbage collect, your application doesn't respond. And this is another uh, garbage collector, uh, sometimes even faster than the ones in Java. OK, unnecessary object creation. Let's look at this example here. Here we create a, a quite big map. It contains uh, a billion objects. We iterate a billion times. We create a, a film in this example. I'm, I tend to use film in my examples. Uh, you will see that later on in the presentation. And I create the film, and I collect them uh, to a map, where I use the film ID as the key, and the film itself. I apply the function identity, which is turned to the same object, and just stores that into the map. And this is a very 
pretty short uh, court snip, uh, code snippet, but unfortunately it will kind of clog the heap. It will create a lot of objects. Because it will not only create a, a film object, it will create a lot of extra objects. I will create, for example, uh, a long or an integer that's used for my key. And I will create map entry for each entry I put into the map. And each of those objects are subjects to overhead and byte alignment. So they will create, take up quite amount of uh, heap space. And when I create this big uh, map, it's also likely that its map will live for a long time. So during the lifetime of my application, all those objects will be kind of evaluated several times by the GC in different modes. And it's also difficult to retrieve the objects because it's just a key value. Yeah, well, if I know the film ID, I can retrieve it immediately. But what if I want to retrieve only those films that are longer than 60 minutes, for example? How do I do that? I have to iterate over all billion objects and kind of filter out what I need. So then I might go about and create a tree map for each column, and that would create uh, an enormous amount of additional objects. And the problem is that the garbage collection time for most implementation of garbage collector is not linear. Uh, it's not proportional to the objects we have. Uh, it's usually quadratic behavior, like shown in this page. And now it says heap size, so you have to think that an object is on average reasonably big. So of course, if you have one object that is uh, 16 gigabyte, uh, this is not the case. But you have to think that this is, uh, represents kind of the number of objects you have. And we've all seen that when we go like to 16 or 20 gigabytes, we kind of hit the wall. This is called, um, well, if you had the cocktail party phenomenon, because there's double amount of people on a cocktail party, you have to shake hands with four times more people. So it's a quadratic uh, dependency. And even just writing an object to main heap memory takes a long time in this perspective. This is a, a Java object, a very short one. Uh, it's, it's 16 bytes, but it will take you about um, uh, 200 nanoseconds just to write it uh, to main memory. So even just creating one object, then it's not ultra low latency anymore on the heap. So it's a challenge to do this. So conclusion, just creating shared objects is not ultra low latency according to my definition of ultra low latency. We can go to the next problem. We, we have perhaps 32 CPUs, but when our Java application runs, we consume only 100% CPU. I'm sure you have seen this on your um, kind of Linux servers. Uh, because it's not multi-threaded, or you get some kind of lock contention, or there are other problems that prevents you from using it uh, for multi-threading. So how can we solve this? Well. The only solution I know is something called in JVM memory. And what is that? How does that differ from in JVM? So in memory in general, it's kind of data. Data is in RAM, of course. And the application is remotely connected to a grid, a machine, or another process. Whereas in JVM is the same, but the application and data resides in the same JVM. So you can actually address your data directly within your JVM process. And why is that important? Well, this is a picture of a CPU. It's a, now it's quite a, some years old, but it shows the principle. On the left-hand side and on the right-hand side, you see the kind of drivers for external um, things like memory and uh, external units. And in the middle section, you have the actual eight CPUs. At the top and the bottom, you see the actual logic, uh, the ALU and stuff like that, logic in the CPU. And the more to the center you go, you have L1, L2, and L3. The, the big section in the middle is actually the L3 cache. The L3 cache is shared between the CPUs. So each and every CPU can use, uh, in conjunction with this other, the L3 cache. And of course, the latency times for, for the caches are much lower than main memory. So of course, we want to be as much as possible in our L1 cache. And then 
if that doesn't work in the L2 and then in the L3. We don't want to access main memory. So this is completely different than accessing things over the network, the orders of magnitude faster. And actually you can view the L3 crash as a communication bus. What if you kind of uh, pin one microservice to one CPU and you pin another microservice to another CPU? And they're not communicating via RAM or they're not commu communicating via network. They are using the L3 cache as a bus. That will give your application a, a big boost. So it's, it's important to understand the hardware your application is running on. Uh, and it's, it's a simulation of in-memory and in-JVM memory, where you have low affinity on your data. Uh, and it's kind of normalized to in-JVM performance. So in this case, it's, uh, the performance is less than 1% and of your, and it's actually two orders of magnitude slower. So that's why in-memory is, is fast. So that's all and good, but how do you scale? How do you scale within JVM memory? That sounds weird, because if you have the, po the possibility to scale out on different nodes, you can just add nodes. Is that even possible? Well, good thing is that a few years ago, I think it was two years ago, a gigabyte of RAM will cost as much uh, as a cup of coffee on Starbucks. So that was kind of a milestone for humanity, I think. So how do you scale up? Well, today on AWS, you can scale up to 12 gig terabytes today. And I have reason to believe that in the near future, you can scale up to 48 uh, terabytes of data in a single machine. Uh, and you can do this as you grow. You can run your application, and then afterwards you can kind of <laughs> scale it up. Uh, so you don't have to reinstall your operating system, or maybe use Docker, and you can deploy it on this uh, bigger machine. Isn't that super expensive then? Well. To the left, you see a graph, what most people, including myself, thought before I uh, dug into the, the facts. On, but on the right-hand side, you see the, the, the fact. And in this case, I've used it an AWS uh, version of servers. And it's not approximately linear. It's a, it is exactly linear, the cost of RAM. So you pay as you grow. It's only the step that's going more and more coarse, the bigger server you have. So what if you have more than terabytes? How much is there someone in here that has more data than 12 terabytes today? Maybe, maybe one, maybe two. OK, at least one and maybe two. So that's definitely the case sometimes, but it's rare, I would say. So if you have more than 12 terabytes, what can you do? Of course, you can uh, kind of shard your data. Maybe you have regions in the world, or maybe you have different years, or you can categorize your data, or you can run two different analyses um, in separate charts, if that's possible. That's kind of one high-level affinity on your data. Maybe you can use uh, IM map mapping like I IMDT. That is, uh, your memory is kind of virtual, but you have hardware that's, that's paging in and out your memory from a very fast SSD. Of course, that will hit your performance a bit, but still you will have a very good performance compared to uh, network solutions. Another alternative is that you might have more than 12 terabytes of data, but it's less than 12 terabytes that is relevant to your uh, problem that you're trying to solve. So maybe you have hundreds of terabytes of data, but the things you want to derive data from, it's, it's less than 12 terabytes. And of course, there are cases when you have much more data than 12 terabytes, and then you can't use this technology. And that's the case. What if, but what if my data grows? Well, uh, if we look at the history, we have this kind of exponential growth of memory. So even though if your application or your underlying data is growing exponentially, you still will be saved by the general growth of, of internal memory. So if you started here back in 2008 and thought that my data is going to be uh, in a few years more than 2.5 terabytes, then when you get there, a general development is that you can still have that. Okay, this is another uh, simulation we did. 
with a 75 correlation uh, of affinity between objects that are being analyzed. And you can see that the performance is consistent for grid solutions, but it's very uh, bad. But it's consistent. OK, low affinity, low latency, and scale out. You can't do that at the same time. But if you replace scale out with scale up, you can do it. OK, so let's look at one solution. Uh, I'm working obviously for Speedment, and we have a solution for this. There are also other solutions. But let me just show how Speedment works. This is one minute, minute video. So if you have a slow um, application, you can use Speedment and connect to your database with a tool. And the tool will retrieve your metadata from your database automatically. So to the left hand side, you have tables and columns. You can do some settings, but in this case, I just press generate. This will generate a complete domain model for me from the database. And now I can view my database as standard Java streams. And I can use everything within the stream ecosystem that's there and view my data. In this case, I collect a bunch of employee data uh, to a list. And this runs against the database from the beginning. But if my application is still slow, I can use this called data store uh, component that will take a snapshot of my database and pull it in off heap in the JVM. And I can do continuous snapshots all the time. And now my streams will not run against the database, but against RAM. And I will get a hundred or thousand times faster applications. So that's the idea. And as I said, you can create continuously snapshots from, from the database. And all the contents of the database you selected will be placed as a copy within the JVM. So this is good for analytics types of application. And you will also have everything off heap. So you can have terabytes of data without impacting garbage collection. Also, all indexing is done off heap. And all the operations, for instance, filtering and stuff like that, ordering, sorting, the complexity of those operations is, in most cases, not dependent on the data size you have. So it doesn't matter if you have a gigabyte or a terabyte, it's the same uh, speed. For some of the operation, it's log n, meaning that it will increase slightly, but only marginally when your data grows. And no impact on garbage collect, because it completely leaves up heap, uh, the garbage collector cannot even see it. So this is the idea. You have, from the beginning, you have a solution with the, with the big heap. But instead, you make things smaller, because you don't have to all the, have all the overheads of the object, and you put them off heap, and you have a very small heap. And that's good for performance and predictability for your application. Everything relies on the standard Java stream. Uh, this is a, a, an interface, it's not a class. So anyone can implement a stream. And this is something I wrote an article about in Oracle Java magazine uh, for about a year ago. So let's take a look at streams. Uh, I think you're all familiar with SQL. Uh, you see uh, the SQL statement at the top. It says we should select all films that satisfied uh, a certain requirement. Namely, the rating should be PG-13. And this doesn't say how the database is going to do that. One opportunity, of course, would be to iterate over each and every film and evaluate the predicate. Is this PG-13? Is this PG-13? Is this PG-13? But it's not likely it's going to do that. It's more likely it will use an index to do that. So we can immediately retrieve all those rows satisfying the requirement. But we don't know that. Uh, maybe it has already pre-computed this uh, list. We don't know that either. The same is actually true for streams. So the first row, films.stream, creates a stream that, when it's consumed, contains all the elements. The next row, with the, the filter, can create a new stream that only contains the stream satisfying the requirement. And we don't know how that's being done. It can be done by actually applying the filter for each element, but it can also be done using an in-memory index. So they are all declarative. 
So this uh, stream, for example, will actually be computed in order one time. So it doesn't matter how many films we have, if we have uh, five films or if we have five trillion films, it will still count all those objects in constant time. Because the, in the implementation of this stream have kind of short circuit the count. So the count sees that, oh, I want to count something, and wow, I have an index. So I just use the index to see how many objects satisfies this requirement. I don't even have to iterate over them. And this is another example. In this case, we have to do something, but we're using a collector here that's also being executed off heap. So let's dig into the details here. This is a bit uh, tricky, but bear with me. Uh, we have a stream that satisfies the requirement, and then we use a collector that's also executed off heap. So we are first using the index to see which items fulfill the rating. And then for each of them, we don't materialize the film. We can only look directly in RAM and retrieve those columns and kind of render the JSON element also off heap. So we will never create a single Java object when this stream is executed, apart from the, from the stream itself. And this goes on for each uh, row. So that's cool. You can also create joins within memory representation. You can combine, uh, of course, uh, several tables like this. So in this case, we have uh, the language, and we combine. And we, we have um, the film and the language, and we combine them together in a join. And in this case, we provide a constructor, so we build a, a tuple, which is a built-in type. But we can also use uh, what are our own objects there if we want to create them. Uh, and we can also have aggregators. So in this case, we have an off-heap aggregator that we kind of have a builder pattern for. We, for example, we have the language ID as a key, and we have a rating as another key, and then we want to compute the average length. So this operation will be also off heap, and then we use the setters provided in the key and average operation to kind of, as an interface, to bring it back off heap. And usually uh, the resulting aggregation is much, much smaller than the actual items we're working with. So that creates, this will not create any intermediary objects uh, when we run the ag actual aggregation. And the cool thing now is that if they snap together, so the stream is aware that if it's an off-heap aggregator, it can use that and short-circuit even the, the creation of the intermediary objects. So this example here will not create any tuples on the heap. It's kind of magical by using objects just as a placeholder, but they are actually never created because we can short-circuit the entire chain. So this uh, stream here will actually um, evaluate totally off-heap without creating a single uh, intermediate object on the heap. And if we want to run it parallel, we can do that too. This will create, depending on how many threads we have on our computer, it will create different aggregations that are all off heap, and they will be working in each thread. And once every thread is completed, they will be merged together as a single aggregation. And then the result of that will be communicated back to the heap, where we can use it in, in normal Java. And that solves the problem of parallel processing. So if we now have 32 uh, threads or CPUs, we can actually use them. So that's good. So let's say I will do a hands-on demo right now, so you can see for yourself how it works and how fast it is. So I will use this uh, Sequila exemplary database. You can download that from MySQL, or there is also available like um, Docker instances you can use on your machine. This is the benchmark. Uh, this is one of the benchmarks I'm going to use in the demo. This is similar to what I showed before. We filter out all uh, films that has a rating of PG-13, and I will count them. And we'll do this millions of times and see what the average latency is. We have a snapshot. Uh, in, the one, in the first scenario, we run against a database. In the second scenario, I will run with Java 8. And in the third scenario, I will use another JVM uh, that I will tell you more about later on. We'll take a snapshot, uh, and we will run from that snapshot. 
So what I did is that I went to the SpeedMet initializer. You can all do this. It's open. Select the database, select data version, and select in-memory acceleration. And then I have a POM file generated for me, and I can run my tests. So when I start it, I will connect to the database, as shown in the film before. I will have generated the data model, and now I am what I'm going to show you here. So this is uh, the case when I have generated my data model from, from the database. And I'm going to start this before I tell you more, because it uh, takes the time for me to run this. So while it's running, I can show you what I do. So first of all, I don't have uh, any in-memory acceleration. Now I'm running against the database. And the test I'm running is here. You recognize film stream, rating equals PD13, and I count how many films satisfied that requirement. And I also have a little bit more a complex stream here. I take all the stream, I sort them in length descending order, I skip some of the films, take the next five films, I extract the rental duration, and then I compute a summary statistics. Summary statistics, the built in feature in Java streams. It will compute things like mean, max, and average, and how many elements there were. Of course, there will be five elements here. And this shows how, how well streams, uh, you can take advantage of the entire ecosystem around streams. So this can be combined with any operation in the stream uh, community. So the first operation when I run to the database, the simple one here is about 1,000 per second. And the second is a little bit more uh, tricky to execute. And because I'm using now the number of operations because the, the resolution in my Mac uh, doesn't allow me to measure actually the performance of what I have. So I have to invert this to get the actual uh, latency. But you will see the difference when I go up here again. So now I'm using Java 8 and in-memory acceleration. And I'm running the same test. So this was around 1,000 operations per second, give or take. So now I'm starting it. And there's first a warm-up iteration. And then I take my snapshot from the database. This took about a second to take a snapshot. And then run off, the program is running. So first, it's a warm-up phase, where I warm up the JVM. And the JVM is able to compile uh, when I've executed a method more than 10,000 times, it's being compiled by the C2 compiler in the JVM. And then I run the actual test, and then comes uh, the other version, filter and count. So now I'm pulling in a snapshot again and running the other test. And while it's running, I can show you the setup for my JMH test. I use one thread. I use one warm-up iteration and one measure iteration. Normally, if you run this in reality, you should have like five warm-up iteration and five measures, but I, we don't have the time to do that. So let's look at the figures here. Uh, before it was 1,000, now it's like 6 million uh, for just one thread on a laptop. So you can imagine what this will do on 32 threads on a server-grade computer. So this is 6 million, that translates to about 175 nanoseconds on average uh, in latency. And even from this more complicated query, I have quite low query, uh, I have a quite low latency. And remember, we, we sorted here and we skipped a lot of things and we did some computation. That's quite amazing. So let me switch now uh, to the third JVM. And I'm going to use, actually, uh, the Grail VM. There was a, a talk here about Grail VM and the thing with Grail VM. I'm going to start this first before I tell you what the thing is. So we don't have to wait. So now it's running. The thing with Grail VM is that it contains uh, an improved C2 compiler. The JIT compiler is it's better. It's rewritten in Java. And it, it has uh, some benefits from the recent research in terms of flattening out codes and optimizing it. So this is uh, presumably a good thing when we're working with Stream because they create intermediary objects and they can all be flattened out and uh, kind of bypassed. 
So let's see what that will do with our application. This is a cliffhanger. We have to wait. I already read it. So this is the second test. Uh, yeah. While we're waiting, I can mention also that you can, if you use this result format with JMH, there are kind of web uh, pages where you can just take the JSON and paste it in, and you can get nice graphs of, of your tests. Okay, so let's look at this. 14 million streams created and consumed in one thread on a laptop. I mean, that's, that is really amazing. And that, if you look at that, uh, you will see uh, the steam latencies here in nanoseconds, and you will see that the, the performance of Grail VM in combination with Speedman streams is really uh, amazing. So you get under 100 nanoseconds on average on this kind of, of streams. So that, that's really good. Okay, uh, of course you can use this uh, kind of technology on, uh, with every data, in any data type of database. And you can use it on files or uh, anything. You can that be converted to a stream? You can deploy them on Oracle Cloud or whatever other clouds that's out there. You can use them in Docker and Kubernetes, or you can run them on-prem. You can use any integration IDE because it's just streams. And you can deploy them on web services like Spring or Java EE. So I guess that concludes my presentation. Uh, you can reach out to me by email. Uh, if you have like performance issues and want some help and engage me in that. Or you can download Speedman and play around. Some of it is open source, so you can have a look at it and maybe contribute if you want to do that. Thank you so much, guys. Yeah. Okay, if you have any questions, uh, I'm happy to answer them. Yes? Yes, I actually have two questions. Okay. Yeah. And then the second question is, you were talking about pinpointing things into a circuit core mm -hmm. between web services. Uh, if you have that kind of performance requirement, wouldn't you, I mean, that's a very specific situation. Wouldn't you just say that it's a design issue, I will merge those two web services because I have a very particular circumstance that I want to... Mm. Okay, so let's, let's talk about the first. The first question was basically, what if my data changes? then my snapshot become useless. That's a short story. Uh, yes and no. Uh, as I said, this is more geared towards data analytics. So if you have transaction happening a thousand times a second, this is probably not a good idea. But if you have data that's changed slowly, it's a good idea. So you can take a snapshot every minute, for example. And then what if my query takes a, uh, 15 minutes? Then even it's better to take a snapshot that takes a minute and then query a few nanoseconds than just submitting a query that will take forever. So that depends on how you look at it. But of course, the more analytic style it is, the better it is. Actually, there is a feature I didn't tell you about here, and that is if you have a snapshot, you can do incrementally change for it, and you can create a new snapshot, and that's a very lightweight uh, operation. So that you, in that case, you can recycle a lot of data you have because each snapshot is immutable because of the thread safety issues. So you can, like if you have updates of maybe hundreds per second, you can still cope with that and create lightweight snapshots and roll them along. Uh, the second question was about, is it really possible to pin down your processes? Like you have, you have web servers, you don't have control over that. Uh, that's how I interpreted your question. And the, and the answer is, in the general case, you can't, of course, pin down your uh, applications to a certain CPU. But if you have, particularly if you have microservices, and particularly if you have thought about how you should write microservices, and maybe you only have them one-threaded, because you, you can write them very efficiently in that way, because you don't have to cope with multi uh, concurrency issues, 
Then you can pin them down, for example, if you deploy them with Docker, there's a feature saying that I only want to use this Docker instance on a single CPU. But in Java, we don't have like thread set uh, affinity to CPU. That's not there, any, uh, at least not now. But maybe in the future, I don't know. But um, so in some cases, it is really possible. But as you rightfully say, that becomes kind of a, a design decision if you choose to do that. And I think it's something you can do if you really have low latency requirements. Uh, then you can start to think about that. But maybe not in the general case. So I guess. Yes, good questions. How, how do I play around with my memory outside the Java heap? And there are several ways to do this. One way is to use uh, um, uh, unsafe. That's there. And you can, with unsafe, it's like C, you can allocate and you can free. Malloc and, and free. We don't do that. We use byte buffer instead. So we allocate byte buffers with a method called allocate direct, which allocates um, byte, byte buffer off heap, but in a controlled way that is compatible with all the Java uh, specifications that's there. So we don't use unsafe, we use byte buffer. And one drawback with the byte buffer is that can, it's indexed by an integer. So it can only contain 2 to the power of 31 bytes. So obviously we have to use several uh, byte buffers. And that's what we do. So a table can contain one or several byte buffer buffers. And if you have terabytes of data, you will have a lot of byte buffers. Uh, but they are handled kind of, uh, the, the framework will handle that uh, automatically for you. So that's, you don't have to care about that. And that's good actually to have several byte buffer because we would use unsafe and just had a single block of memory. If we did a small update, we have to kind of copy all that memory and affect and do the, the change. Whereas if we have several byte buffers, we can see which byte buffer is affected. And we can create a variation of that byte buffer and then reuse all the other byte buffers in the new snapshot. So we can reuse all those immutable uh, snapshot, uh, byte buffers that we have and only change maybe a fraction of those that were affected by the actual update. Do we have any more questions? Yes? <coughs> Uh, also a very good question. Does it support other sources than just regular relational databases? And yes, it does. Actually, it supports anything that can be turned into a stream. So if you can write kind of your own class that can create a C from a CSV file, can create a stream, uh, which is very easy to do. We can use Avro files. There is built-in support for Avro files. Uh, there was even a guy who did a connection to Google Docs. <laughs> so you can have a Google Docs as a, a database. Exactly. You can have a remote REST call or you can have it on file with any format or whatever. So yes. Or you can have a NoSQL database, for example, MongoDB or whatever you want. More questions? Okay. Uh, next question. Can I connect it to Google Bigtable or other things? And again, the answer is if you can convert it to a stream, then you can use it. And I I'm almost certain that you can uh, convert that to a stream. So the answer is, uh, with almost certainty, uh, yes. Oh, yeah. Question is, uh, how does the snapshot uh, affect the startup of the application? Uh, it does affect the startup of the application, and it depends, of course, the more data you have, the longer time it will take. In this example, it took one second uh, to download, and you can download, like, on a server-grade computer, it's easy to download millions, if not millions, of rows per second. But if you have billions or trillions of rows, uh, it might take some minutes to start your application, and in those cases, you have to have, like, several nodes serving data. So if you, some, if you want to bring down a node for maintenance or upgrades, or if one node uh, and your application doesn't work anymore, uh, you have to have other nodes uh, to kind of cope with the data while you're loading the next node. But again, it's a trade-off. Yes, it takes time to load, but yes, it gets much faster once you're loaded. So it's a trade-off. Yes? More, yes? Yes. 
Yes. So I guess it's this to the circumstance of the remote. Yeah. That is true. Um, if you have um, billions of objects out there and, you, and you're uncareful of what you do with your objects once you have, uh, if you initiate a stream and you map it to some obscure object and then you, you of course, put that in a map that's long living, of course, you recreate a bunch of objects. That is true. I, I guess strings are hard to avoid. Yeah. <coughs> and yes and no. I would say, like, the, uh, the aggregator you saw here, you can use a string as a key, for example. And that, that virtual string lives off heap too. It's like, it's, it's like similar to C, I would say. This, this framework was also written our own memory management uh, off heap. So we do our own allocation, our own life cycles of our objects, which are simpler than the objects on the actual Java heap because they don't have synchronization, for example. And there are... Uh, known a priori. We don't have a class pointer because we know from the position of where they exist what kind of object it is. And they are specialized for the purpose they're being used. So it's, it's a much easier thing, even though it's not easy to do it, uh, it's doable. So all those, uh, like aggregation or usage of, of string, strings, uh, happens all behind the scene and they are never created on the heap. But, but it's true, like you said, if you, if you Bring them back on the heap, and if you're not careful, you will get a lot of objects on your heap. That is true. Absolutely. Okay. Okay, good. No. Yes. Yeah, that is very important. That was a design decision from the beginning. Uh, this should be completely you know, deployable on anything that Java is deployable on. So there's no native code whatsoever. It's pure Java. Okay, yes, thank you so much. Thanks. <laughs>